Hello, I'm Sheila Schroeder. I lead business development here at Private Ocean Wealth Management. Today I'm here with Chip Pfeiffer, one of our lead advisors and a partner in our firm. Chip, it's felt like an incredible roller coaster ride here these last three months. Over the next 20 minutes, it would be great if we could take a deeper dive and discuss the key attributes of a private ocean portfolio, speaking to diversification, portfolio structure, and discipline. Could we kick off our discussion today by having you highlight one of these attributes? Hi, Sheila. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, before we jump into the finer details of a private ocean portfolio, I wanted to acknowledge that our entire team is committed to financial planning and there's a great deal of rigor that goes into each client's financial plan there um, basically to get towards what their goals are and aligning their portfolio to help get there. Today we're just jumping right into the investments and as you noted diversification is one of the tops we're going to, co going to cover. I wanted to spend the bit of time we have together to focus on more precisely global diversification. Um, diversification in general, um, sophisticated investors or experienced investors have been familiar with diversification, but a lot of people get caught into their habits or just inertia and forget to diversify. And this is a fun little comment from the New Yorker magazine um, where this gentleman is being reminded by his mother to be sure to, to diversify. Uh, sometimes it takes a nudge to do things that seem so common. Uh, when you get into your own habits. So that's kind of a fun way to start our discussion. To start the actual discussion, I wanted to highlight a phenomenon that, that we've uh, studied. It's called home country bias. And this is this idea that we tend to invest in what's familiar to us. Um, and what the data reveals is that around the world, there is this phenomenon in all countries, especially the developed countries, uh, of investors um, pursuing what's familiar to them. And let's highlight South Korea to start. In South Korea, the average South Korean invests about 80% of their portfolio, or a little more than 80% of their portfolio, in companies from South Korea. Yet the South Korean market, actual market, represents just a little bit over 2% of the global market. It's a little unusual, like 80% of the portfolio of an average South Korean is in uh, South Korean companies, yet only 2%. That phenomenon, you can see that consistency around along all those countries on the uh, lower horizontal line there. The United States is a little bit more um, rational, uh, residents of the United States, where the average investor in the United States is a little bit over 70% of their portfolio is in US companies. But the United States, when you look at it globally, represents about 50 to 55% of the total stock market in the world. There's not really any economic basis for that. Yeah, I definitely, we talk about this all the time. We definitely see a local bias with our Bay Area friends where their portfolios are often heavy with tech stock. Right, definitely in the Bay Area, you do see that, um, that happening. You see it around the country. You see it in uh, states like Texas where um, you, there's been a lot of research around this. Looking at the people that live in Texas, they have a tendency to have overweighting to oil stocks. You see it in uh, states like Atlanta or states like Georgia and Atlanta with Coca-Cola stock, it's this tendency to just go be, gravitate towards what's familiar. But the point we're trying to emphasize today is that there's not really a financial basis for this. It's not as though the returns are better with those things that we're familiar with. It's just easier to do it. Um, I want to take a moment here to introduce a slide here um, of the 22 developed countries around the world. Uh, so Chip, help me better understand this slide. Yeah, this is a, a pretty busy slide. Um, so let me walk through this. What we have here is um, over a period of 20 years, 1999 through 2018, um, the performance of several countries around the world. There are, in this slide deck here, you have 22 different countries or developed countries around the world. And at the top, you have the highest returning and at the bottom, you have the lowest returning. So 1999, to give an example, we had Finland come up with a 152% rate of return in 1999. That was the highest rate of return that year for all developed countries. The lowest returning country that year in 1999 was Belgium 
with about negative 14 percent. If you look a little closer, uh, the United States kind of in the middle ground there at 21 percent. If you seek a little further and look where the United States has performed at the top of this list of countries, you see that the United States has only been at the top one time, and it was in 2014, where the United States had about a 12% rate of return. If you look a little deeper, and it's really squint your eyes, you see that the United States has fallen below the 50% level nine out of the 20 times, or about 45%. So nine out of the 20 years, the United States has fallen below the median for all the 22 developed countries in the world. So what this to me suggests is that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity out there to be invested in other countries around the world and participate in those expected returns or those positive returns over time. You know, it's so easy to think that the U.S. is regularly going to be on the top, but you've explained that really well. In terms of how Private Ocean structures portfolios to capture positive returns opportunity across all markets, how, how do you think about that? Right, uh, that's a, this is a great question. So Private Ocean's approach has been for many, many years to not try to insert our own biases or opinions about the source of positive returns or when markets are gonna outperform in, uh, in some areas and not perform well in other areas. Rather than that approach, our, we approach global investing in this way. We, we pursue something called global market cap weighting. And to help understand that, I'd like to share this map, which is a map of the world, as I think everyone can see. But rather than being structured on the basis of the size of geographical size of a country, or let's say the GDP or economic output of a country, or the size of their population, rather than those approaches, this is a what's called a cartogram based on the market capital weighting of each country's stock market. So on the left here, you see the United States, it's about, it says 54%. So at the end of 2018, the United States represented about 54% of the global stock market. And if you look for the far right, you see Japan here at about 8%. And during the course of time in every year, there's a little bit of movement between countries. Um, over the decade prior, I think in 2009, the United States was right at about 50% but it's slowly increased over this last decade because of the performance of the United States. Another observation here that surprises many is how small some of these enormous countries are, like China and like India. And the point here is that these, uh, this, this uh, data is not based on, again, population or GDP, but rather the size of stock markets. So Chip, the US has outperformed for the past decade. Why stick with international? Yeah, that is a very common question, a very common observation. Um, so I'm gonna walk through a couple slides here. Um, here we have data of the S&P 500 performance uh, between January 2010 and December of 2018. And I think most investors are aware that the S&P 500 or, or more appropriately stated, the, the United States stock market has been dominating returns for the last several years. And you can see it in this data where the S&P 500 has outperformed this, what's referred to as this global equity index. And this is a basket of global stocks that does include the United States. And over this period of time, the S&P 500 um, has produced a return, which has taken a dollar and turned it into $2.71, pretty healthy return. And that global basket of stocks has been less than that, around $2.23 uh, from a dollar. So this tendency is to say, wow, well, this has been really working out well, let's stay on this bandwagon. Or for that matter, let's get out of global stocks and move towards what clearly is doing better, the S&P 500, and get on, that, get on that train. But a little bit closer scrutiny of the data, historical data, might change that opinion. So if you look at the decade before, um, the prior decade before 2010, the period between January 2000 and December of 2009, the, the reverse happened, where the S&P 500 bumped along and actually produced a negative return during that decade. That $1 turned into about 91 cents. However, the global basket of stocks, or that global equity index, that dollar grew from a dollar to $2, a little over $2 over that period of time. 
a, a huge difference of returns here. In fact, in that, towards the end of that de decade, you can probably guess it, a lot of investors and clients was, were very enamored by the international market. And many of them made the mistake of changing their US allocation over to, to foreign in the hopes of getting a better return. Now, if you look back even more over more time, and we're gonna just go all the way back to 1970 and tie together nearly 50 years of data, you take the two, two same indexes, the S&P 500 down here, and that global equity basket of uh, stocks or the global equity index, you can see very, very obviously here the compounding power of staying globally diversified over that period of time and capturing a far better rate of return. Well, I can see how recent U.S. performance can cause people to assume that international is not competitive. So I really appreciate the additional clarity there. If we could, I'd like to pivot to portfolio structure. Has anything changed in terms of how you think about portfolios during this time of pandemic and market volatility? Well, yeah, this is a real hot kind of question or hot button issue because we are in the midst of a really traumatic time and a lot of um, stress in markets and stress at home and stress around the world related to the pandemic. And a lot of media out there, a lot of financial media specifically, um, talking about uh, investment opportunities in light of the changes around the world that related to the pandemic. Um, our approach is not to chase those opportunities or chase after ideas, simply because it just brings in more risk into the portfolio. We, we stick to our existing approach, which is to stay exposed to the market and to capture certain attributes of the market that we think are favorable and have historically been favorable and staying disciplined and staying in those attributes um, until there's enough evidence and research to, to demonstrate that a change is necessary or merited. Before I um, jump into some data to share with everybody, I thought I would just break the ice a little bit to say we're going to be looking at historical data and it's uh, and performance data specifically, and it's really important to acknowledge that past performance is no guarantee of future results, much like your favorite restaurants when it changes ownership, sometimes you're not gonna get quite the experience <laughs> that you were accustomed to. Same thing with markets. Um, so I thought I would just bring a bit of levity into what we're talking about today. So what we're, you're asking about is like market returns, and, and I referred to sources of returns in markets. Um, our approach to this is to seek reliable and historically persistent sources of returns. Some examples that um, are familiar the, to many investors are several that aren't, are on the screen right now. And you think about stocks, think of small cap stocks and large cap stocks or growth or value stocks, momentum, you have volatility on this list and micro cap stocks. These are all thought of as factors or uh, areas of the markets where you can isolate exposure. Can you give us some examples of these factors, Chip? Well, so, several are on your screen right now, um, but I only want to couple of, cover a couple um, for the sake of time. The two we're going to focus on today is the, the uh, one of the biggest factors or dimensions, and that's referred to as the market return. And then I'll get into the size, what's called the size premium. So the first one is market. And this is I think mostly common sense for most uh, investors, most uh, experienced or sophisticated investors. And this simple notion that is stocks outperform bonds. Um, and, and the history is just full of evidence around the stock market has outperformed the bond market. And we can see this when we look at the data. And in this case, we're representing this over a period of uh, nearly uh, 90 years of the stocks outperforming, in this case, T-bills or treasury bills. And when you see the blue line, like you do in 2019, what that means in this data set is the previous 10 years, stocks on average outperformed T-bills by it looks like about 12% during those 10 years. And that persistence of that outperformance is pretty obvious by looking at the data and visually represented on this slide deck. There are pockets in time in many of these eras people can relate to where the 10 year period prior to the start of that year that was highlighted here, we actually had a period of time where T-bills outperformed stocks. So this should probably resonate with most of our investors around the great financial recession. If you had invested in the year, the 10 year prior to 2000, the bottom of the market in 2009, your portfolio of stocks underperformed T-bills. 
But what we also learn by looking at the data is how quickly that recovery eventually happens. And so we're not here to say that stocks outperform T-bills always, but the persistence is pretty significant. And we see this next slide, we can see that a little bit more in more detail about that persistence, um, where over a, in this case, the United States market, over a one year, a five year, and a 10 year period, that persistence, the, the percentage of times that stocks outperform T-bills is substantial. You see 70%, 78% on five years, and up to north of 80% over a 10 year cycle. Is this true for international stocks as well? Yeah, you see it this right next here on the right side of this slide, um, the same, same outcome where stocks in foreign developed countries, that's this developed foreign markets minus the United States markets, the so foreign developed markets have also at a very high percentage rate outperformed T-bills. You see the statistics here, 63% over one year, 70% for five years and 90, 94% over a 10 year rolling period. So that's a fairly substantial, again, I sometimes say if you could go to Las Vegas and walk in with these odds, you probably would end up living there <laughs> and never leaving. Um, the next factor that I noted that I'd highlight is the second one on this list, which is what's referred to as the size premium. And this is where uh, historically with the evidence, we can see it is small caps outperforming large caps or small companies outperforming large companies. And the, to make this a little bit more relatable, this is on based on market cap size and market capitalization. So large companies are companies that are valued over about $10 billion. And small companies are those companies that are, that are valued below $2 billion. And these are companies on stock exchanges. And what, we've, uh, what the research has revealed is that over time, small companies outperform large companies. This is called the size premium. That premium is the excess return of small stocks versus large stocks. In a similar format that we saw for the market, what we see here is periods of time where stocks or sorry, small cap stocks outperform large cap stocks at a fa fairly persistent basis. And you do see pockets of red for sure where small cap stocks have underperformed large cap stocks. But historically, when you go back this 90 year period, you do see the persistence of that small cap premium or that, that spread, that return spread over large caps. Go a little deeper into this, you see uh, additional data here showing small companies outperforming large companies on a fairly reliable and consistent basis. So on this, what you see in their screen now on a one and five year and 10 year basis, a pretty consistent pattern of outperformance. And, and Sheila asked earlier about developed uh, the international markets if this phenomenon was, was persistent during in those countries? And the short answer is yes. In the developed international markets, small caps have outperformed large caps consistently. And you see even a little bit more so than the US developed markets. And so the last point here I'll just share is that this is a little bit of a, a um, it's a long period of time, but dating back to 1926, if you look at the comparison between small cap and large cap stocks and the growth of a dollar, you, you see over this very long period of time, substantial outperformance of small cap stocks over large caps. No, I find this so helpful. Could you also maybe talk about how Private Ocean translates this strategy and this theory into practice? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so this is a one way to visualize this is to think of this slide that you have on your screen right now as, as similar to an ice tray and an ice tray with water in it. And this represents the market. And this little arrow here reminds us uh, to, to think of a, a, this approach as tilting into those factors that we just discussed that have the higher returns and we highlighted small caps to, fa to tilt into those factors. So taking that ice tray and just modestly tilting it so it moves a little of the water in the ice tray into that factor that has, that, has given that, that premium. And we highlighted small caps as an example. The idea is you take the market exposure by, in your portfolio and tilt it into some of these factors. Small cap is the one we focused on today to get a little bit more exposure there to capture the future expected premium. 
So we've talked about diversification, portfolio structure. I'd love to go to discipline. Clearly, coronavirus has created so much uncertainty in global markets. Investor emotions are running high. We know that when emotions are running the show, often discipline goes out the window. Yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. is discipline especially important during significant market volatility? Right. It's, it's actually, this, this subject probably should have been at the top of our list because it's such a key aspect of investor success. Um, and we're right in the middle of um, unprecedented times with the, the pandemic globally and really unprecedented times with the volatility that we've all experienced in markets um, that started to sort of start in the mid, mid month of February and culminated towards the end of March. And just a convergence of just strong emotions and convictions and fear and, and just, just, a, just a whirlpool of a lot of um, uh, potentially very damaging behaviors on, for investors to deal with. So, so for a moment, I'd like to just pause from the moment and take ourselves out of this current, the coronavirus era that we're in right now and the, the uh, volatility we've been in recently and walk through a couple of slides to, to highlight some aspects of markets that historically we've seen um, crisis. So take a, take a moment and take a look at the slide here. And what we see here is the growth of a dollar. And it's here on the left side. And this dollar over a period of time and some bumpy bumps in the road turns into $69. So I, I didn't mention that this is a, the growth of a, a dollar in a globally diversified stock portfolio. So at the beginning point, we have a dollar and by the end point, $69. And I pulled out my calculator and I figured out that that's about a little over eight and a half percent annualized rate of return. I'd be happy with that. <laughs> you would. And the question that I'm surprised Shirley didn't ask me is, well, well how long did it take mm -hmm. to get that eight and a half percent rate of return? Uh, but I'm with you. If I could get eight and a half percent and turn my dollar into $69, I'd be darn happy with that. That's a pretty darn pr uh, productive rate of return. The missing piece here that, that we're now looking at is how long did it take to turn that dollar into $69? And what we have, I'm revealing a little bit more, is that this, this period of time from 1970 through, through the end of 2019 took that $1 investment with an 8.5% rate of return to the $69. And I'm with you, Sheila. If we could put that in a bottle and guarantee that, that would be a pretty, pretty hot selling item. Um, it did take a while. So let's not dismiss the fact that this is a nearly 50-year period, but even at 50 years at eight and a half percent to turn one dollar into 69 dollars is a pretty compelling investment proposition okay so i think everyone would agree with that that would be a pretty nice thing to end up with with a dollar invested over that period of time however life isn't really like that uh what we're sharing with you now is the same growth of a dollar over that 50-year period we've now brought in historical events during this 50-year period and what many if not everybody on this call can do is look at some of these events and relate to them where they were at that moment in time uh, how old they were maybe they were in school or earlier in their career or perhaps approaching retirement right at the beginning of retirement and these crisis events happen and i'm just going to pick on a couple like 1987 black monday was a significant one the dot-com stock crash or the tech bubble as it's often referred to. 9-11 is a significant event, obviously in our history. Several others that you can see on your own. Put yourself back in a time machine and remember how fearful you were at the time, or for that matter, your family or people you knew, and the market in general was definitely under a stress. What this is a reminder of is markets aren't that easy like that earlier slide where we didn't have, all we had was a time period and the growth of a dollar. Here we actually see the events. Here we can actually probably remember how we might've felt in those moments of time when fear started to really come into our conscience. This is um, a phenomenon that, uh, that we don't often pause and think about, of how we behave, how our brains work. Um, there is a ton of research on this in the broad sense, it's called behavioral finance. There's an enormous field of research around investor behavior 
But when you really distill it down, it kind of can be simplified by looking at it in this chart or this graph here on your slide or your screen, where we go through this cycle, where we start with optimism, I'm speaking to how human behaviors are, and we, run, we, we are excited and we go into elation. And I'm gonna make this relatable. Let's think about the end of 2019 and hitting into 2020. There was a tremendous amount of optimism and arguably, arguably elation. And then something happens where as an investor, you're, you're given some, some information that gives you some fear. You get a bit nervous and you start to second guess your, your, where you are and what you're doing. And that tends to culminate after more information starts coming in about that are validating your fears or your concerns and then in full on fear. And then often in markets, you see this with selling or lowering risky asset exposure. And then ultimately there's a, there's a capitulation where many investors are joining the same bandwagon and you get a crisis capitulation market and you hit a bottom. And then that, that cycle happens. It starts moving from fear back towards optimism because of the news or whatever's happening in the world. We have seen this in a very short period of time just this year from the beginning of this year where there was a confluence of optimism and, and elation. And then we had a, an event that is the pandemic that came in suddenly, very quickly, and nervousness hit the market sometime in the February timeframe and then full on fear and real capitulation towards the end of March was, was definitely absorbed by the markets around the world and you had a, a very significant sell off and then surprising optimism pick, kick back in and we're still in the midst of this, but markets have recovered, recovered substantially since this time. The point we're making here is the, the tendency is to make financial decisions during these emotions and most investors or humans make the wrong decision at the wrong time. And it's, a, it's based on the science around the brain and how we tend to come up with assumptions and conclusions and act on them. And we tend to act them on them at the wrong time. So I, I've circled this one here that this trend looks good, should continue for a long time. I think most people felt, a lot of people felt that way in um, the first couple of months of this year. And that quickly turned, excuse me, uh, when uh, people start second guessing their investing decisions and they've decided like, oh, we've got to make a change. Well, it really speaks again to the, that sort of roller coaster of emotion. And it's so easy to understand how an investor has an emotional reaction to market uncertainty and feel the need to make changes. That's right. That's right. And that's, um, that's where the pitfalls happen. And, and I thought I would kind of, um, close our discussion today about historical bear and bull markets. Um, this is a different way of looking at the historical data and thinking about the emotions of investors. And what you see on this slide is over the last nearly 100 years um, of the size of both bull and bear markets. And to help viewers see what we have here, the red uh, part of the slides are the markets after a 10% correction. So there haven't been that many in the last 100 years. I think there are 13 on this slide here where we had a period of time where we went into negative territory. And I'll pick on, um, I'll pick on the Great Depression starting in 1926 through 1931 or so. The total market was down nearly 83% or a little bit over 83% over that short period of time. What is telling about this was how quickly the bull market kicked back in and its duration. So what we are observing here is not only the magnitude, which is the negative or positive rate of return, but the duration or the amount of time. And there are some takeaways here. Yes, bear markets happen, but guess what? We are all of us rational thinkers here. We know bull markets follow. And you can see visually here, the bull market not only is higher or greater in magnitude, in other words, the, the rate of return, I'll pick up on this data point here, it's only a much greater rate of return and its duration or period of length is much longer. So my takeaway on this one is when you're in the midst or if any of us are in, a, in the midst of a market crisis, hang on, be patient, <laughs> catch, on, catch it on the rebound and ultimately that investment approach will, 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 will win the race. You know, Chip, I find this chart actually to be pretty comforting 
And I appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to walk us through diversification, portfolio structure, discipline, and how it's just so important to sort of stay the course. This has been particularly helpful. Uh, so thank you very much. You're welcome, Sheila. I enjoyed our time together. For any of you who are watching this presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us at privateocean.com. We're here to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.